Without further ado, I'll introduce your co-host, Dan Halperin, who's a producer and a line producer with over 20 years of experience. He's currently co-producing a documentary about the musician Harry Chapin, and Stephen Beer, who's a partner at FWRV with a practice concentrating in film and television. He counsels filmmakers and production companies on all facets of production, from finance through distribution, and annually is selected as a super attorney within the field of entertainment law. Stephen co-authors the legal FAQ column for Documentary Magazine, the International Documentary Association publication. Turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Rivka. So it's a very uh, honor, special honor for me to introduce tonight's special guest, David Dinnerstein. David and I have been colleagues for many years, worked on a number of projects together. So it's uh, just an honor to have him tonight to uh, lend his expertise regarding the critical topics of uh, film distribution and marketing. Uh, David Dinnerstein produced the Academy Award nominated Netflix original documentary, Winter on Fire, Ukraine's Fight for Freedom, for which he was also nominated for an, an Emmy Award. More recently, Dinnerstein produced Cries from Syria, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and was acquired by HBO. He was the winner of the Critics' Choice Documentary Awards, and Dinnerstein was also nominated for an Emmy Award. Dinnerstein is currently producing a documentary about the legendary but widely unknown 1969 Harlem Cultural Festival, which was known as Black Woodstock. The 40 hours of concert footage has been locked in a vault and never seen before. It features Sly Stone, Stevie Wonder, Nina Simone, B.B. King, Gladys Knight, and the Pips, The Fifth Dimension, David Ruffin, Max Roach, Abby Lincoln, Hume uh, Masakala, Mahalia Jackson, Mavis Staples, and Jesse Jackson, amongst others. Dynastine distributed and marketed many iconic documentaries over the years, including The Thin Blue Line, Paris is Burning, Madonna, Truth or Dare, Mad Hot Ballroom, Neil Young, Heart of Gold, Al Pacino's Looking for Richard, and Jay-Z's Fade to Black. He also helped in the distribution of Metallica, Some Kind of Monster, which is a, a film we discussed with Joe Berlinger two weeks ago when he was our special guest. And of course, the cause-related documentaries, Be Here, Be Here Now and Celebrity. David, it's really great to have you here. And I'm going to uh, start off the question by asking, in light of, the, of your um, proud history of, uh, of working in marketing and distributing and producing films for decades, tell us, how has the industry evolved over the years? Take us from general to specific and where we are today. Sure. First of all, I just wanted to thank Rivka, Dan, Dan, and and Stephen, for hosting me tonight, uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, provide some color on our industry. Uh, and, you know, the big question is how has the industry changed over the course of uh, the past 20 plus years? Uh, it's been disrupted a few times. Uh, you know, I think first and foremost, as most of you can see, I have a picture of the Cannes Film Festival behind me. Uh, I'm not in Cannes, I wish I was. Can is an on this year for the first time in many, many years, I think ever. Uh, but I'm paying homage to Can uh, this week by posting a photo every day while I'm on Zoom uh, meetings because it is a place that I can get a lot of business done. Having said that, Can is not necessarily known for uh, championing documentary films. The last film to have won the uh, uh, Palme d'Or in Cannes was Michael Moore's. Uh, film Fahrenheit 9-11, which I believe was 2004. And I think prior to that, uh, the only other film to have won the Palme d'Or in Cannes as a documentary was in the 50s. Uh, I think we're in sort of a, you know, despite COVID-19, despite us all working from home right now, uh, the disruption that the pandemic has caused has also provided a lot of opportunity for filmmakers. Uh, now more so than ever, we're seeing people at home really uh, binge on uh, documentaries on the various sh streaming plat platforms, whether it's uh, in their own home on their TV or on a desktop or on a laptop or iPad. Uh, I think, you know, we're starting to see 
a lot of articles right now uh, talk about uh, the amount of audiences increasing in respect to the documentary space uh, for the first time ever uh, because of the lack of festivals. We're now seeing enterprising distribution companies forge a relationships with both the theaters and the platforms and conducting virtual uh, theatrical opportunities. Uh, we're seeing that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, you know, with a film that Neon uh, released on Friday uh, called Spaceship Earth. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing it with a handful of other films right now that are using uh, sort of these virtual platforms, if you will. But I think the biggest change in general since I start started, when I, you know, the first film I ever uh, worked on was... Uh, uh, Billy uh, was a, was a was I think an iconic documentary called The Thin Blue Line. Uh, I was just a kid at the time, and you know that film you know could have lived in two uh, places at the time. It could have lived in the theater, which is what we did with it, or it could have lived on a platform like PBS, and that was it. Uh, there weren't a lot of other uh, choices for a film like that, uh, and I think you know things have changed considerably. Now we have uh, a tremendous amount of opportunities uh, and platforms that are not only interested in supporting documentary films, but their audiences are yearning and asking for it as well. Whether it is the big streaming platforms like Netflix or HBO or Hulu or Showtime uh, or Amazon or some of the more specific uh, over the top platforms and some of the free cable platforms like CNN, uh, Discovery. Uh, there are so many opportunities right now uh, to sort of, you know, get your documentary seen. And then of course, there are still the uh, traditional platforms, the theatrical distribution companies. And although they may not be in the theaters as we speak, I still believe in that uh, experience. I think there's nothing I like it and I sort of, you know, wait for it to restart again. I think for certain films, it's going to be bigger and better than ever. Hey, uh, hey, David, it's Dan. So quick question. I have my great new idea for a film. I can't wait to start shooting. I want to start shooting tomorrow. But when should I start thinking about marketing and how do I define uh, my film's audience? How do I figure that out? I think that's a great question and it should probably be the first question that anyone asks themselves or their friends prior to putting any money, time or energy behind a project. Who's the audience and how am I going to reach them? Uh, and marketing films, uh, whether it's a documentary or a narrative feature really takes the discipline of understanding who that audience is and, and, and figuring out a way to reach them. Uh, even if it's on your own, if necessary. So I would suggest that, you know, as you're either building a treatment or you're building a deck, that that's one of the questions, you know, you ask yourself and you help yourself to find that uh, in a serious way. Understand not only who the demographic is, uh, what their ha habits are, where I might be able to reach them. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, uh, that's going to help you land a distribution deal a lot faster uh, than if you went there uh, and simply said, you know, I've made this great film or my friends tell me it's great. Uh, now it's up to you. Tell me what you can do with it. I think that, you know, I've heard the word no so many times uh, when I'm on the other side and selling a film that in order to sort of help someone do their own job, you know, provide them with the tools that they may need. And marketing is definitively one of those. It's no different than trying to raise a money. Marketing is essentially another word for sales. Raising money to finance your film is another word for sales. Uh, I think, you know, story uh, telling is obviously the most important component, but marketing, I think, is a close se second. So how do you so balance, speak... oh, I'm sorry, Steve, go ahead. Okay, uh, so speaking of marketing, at, uh, 
it's 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 so important as you've just said to uh target your audience build your audience but what about identifying entities that are already vested in the space these uh potential partners how do you identify them and what are the steps that producers should take to bridge relationships to bring them in to help help you uh build that audience and uh you know and build a campaign for the film Sure. I think that's also a phenomenal question. Uh, you know, there, I think there's a yearning for documentaries uh, in this day and age that make a difference uh, to some extent. And I think we're seeing, you know, a lot of cause related films that, that can provide, you know, a forum for social impact. We have companies like a participant and Vulcan that are doing a really nice job in respect, you know, in respect to, uh, uh, using social impact to 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 uh not only grow an audience but 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 provide something you know specifically for them as well uh i think there are also uh you know a lot of companies such as the new york times for instance that coming out of the sundance film festival i think were involved in two or three films uh that really made a difference uh I think you need to, as you're starting to look and uh, play with the subject you're about to explore, think about the opportunities of where you might be able to reach those audiences, whether it, you know, are uh, traditional organizations or whether they are more grassroots oriented. Uh, there are so many uh, that are out there and, and, you know, not only you know, can you look there, you can look uh, for organizations that are charitable and supporting uh, story uh, tellers uh, from the very get go. So I think, you know, you just need to, you know, before uh, launching the rocket, if you will, you need to go out, take a few uh, meetings and explore those opportunities of organizations that may want to be uh, supportive from day one, they could be supportive uh, in respect to uh, helping you build an audience, or they could be supportive in respect to helping finance the film as well. So uh, in regards to film festivals, like what are the important ones that people should be looking at for documentaries to get into? And how, how far in advance should people start thinking about their film festival strategy? Uh, you know, so this is my opinion. I think, you know, there are so many great, festivals and it really depends upon what the strategy is overall uh if you are creating a movie uh with the hopes of selling it to a traditional distribution company or platform there's probably about a dozen festivals uh that make the most sense if you are making a film that you simply uh want to uh travel around the world with from festival to festival there are dozens and dozens and dozens of those, you know, that uh, can provide a forum to establish word of mouth and awareness. But I think, at least from my perspective, there are a handful that make sense. And I'll start from sort of in a chronological order that, and again, this is just me, there are others, but I think full frame documentary in uh, Durham, North Carolina is, is really, you know, a phenomenal, festival, it's four days, they screen about 100 docs. Uh, Hot Docs, which takes place in uh, Toronto at the end of April is also, you know, uh, uh, a festival that's starting to really uh, uh, come up. Uh, you know, can, as I had mentioned before, you know, as, as, as much as it's such an important festival, it's the, it's the mother of all festivals, you know, has not necessarily provided a historical context for being overly supportive of docs, but it's a great place. It's an OTOR driven festival. And if you have a film that, that, you know, can tell a story, it's a phenomenal place. Uh, AFI docs, uh, which was created by AFI and I believe the discovery channel, uh, you know, is held every year, I believe in June, uh, in Maryland and Washington is also a great festival. Uh, it has a lot of local support. Uh, then you have, 
things like the Sheffield Dock Fest in the UK, which is a, a, a festival that takes place uh, in June. And then you start uh, heading into the summer and fall. And obviously I miss Tribeca, which is, you know, also, you know, a, a, a good festival uh, where the buyers are out there as well. Then you have places like the Telerod Film Festival. If you're lucky enough to get an invitation, I would do everything you can to get there. It's a phenomenal place to screen a movie. Uh, and it has been, you know, in recent years, the arbiter of many Academy Award films. Uh, and then you, you know, have the Toronto International Film Festival. I think we all know about that one. The Venice Film Festival in Italy uh, is phenomenal because of its worldwide uh, presence. And then you have Mill, uh, Mill Va Valley in the Bay Area, uh, which is a small town festival uh, but it's especially important because there are a lot of Academy uh, and TV Academy me members that uh, reside there. Uh, you have the Hamptons and Woodstock, and then you have the New York Film Festival, which again is, is, is one of the great festivals uh, in the world. And then rounding out the rest of the year, you have a small festival in Maine called the Camden Film Festival, which is very supportive of documentaries. Then you have Doc NYC, uh, which uh, you know helps uh, the Academy a uh, narrow down sort of the vast array of films uh, uh, that are on their list. And then you have the BFI London Film Festival in London. And then you know at, towards the end of the year you have the IDFA, which is the grandpa of all Doc Fests, uh, or the grandmother takes place in. Amsterdam, uh, typically around Thanksgiving, uh, and again, it's a phenomenal festival. So those are a handful. That's not to dismiss, you know, other festivals like San Francisco, Seattle, uh, you know, the Savannah Film Festival, the Miami Film Festival. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on, but the, the, the ones that I mentioned, or at least for me, the most important documentary film festivals around the world. So, so you, you left out Sundance and South by Southwest. Is that because they're just so obvious or? Because they're obvious. I think those right. are very important festivals. The Sundance Film Festival at the beginning of the year has, uh, you know, made many documentaries. Uh, there have been some huge sales. Having said that, I also feel that they, the Sundance Film Festival, as much as I love it, uh, and I've both, you know, seen a lot of great docs and acquired a lot of great docs there, sometimes can uh, build expectations that, that need to be managed. Sometimes, you know, it's not really about that uh, because it can just catch fire there. Uh, I remember, for instance, a few years ago, there was a movie called Step that everyone was talking about, which was a phenomenal film about uh, uh, a dance club, uh, you know, in a inner city school. Uh, and, you know, everyone said, this is gonna be the next big thing. And, you know, I have no idea why it didn't perform commercially per se, but, you know, it was a huge deal. The filmmakers, you know, had a big acquisition, but it didn't perform at that a level. And then, you know, on the other side of that, and this goes back years, uh, there was a film I acquired years ago uh, called Mad Hot Ballroom, uh, which actually was not invited to the Sundance Film Festival and, you know, didn't get in. So, uh, you know, I saw that outside of the festival at Slamdance, where it was in invited, and I ended up buying that film. Uh, and again, I don't know if someone can check, but this probably goes back 15 years or so. Uh, I don't remember specifically, but I bought the the North American rights for about three million bucks, a very expensive film. The movie ended up doing eight plus million bucks at the box office. It was a phenomenal hit for everyone. And it's still one of my favorite documentaries of all time. Uh, so, uh, and then of course, South By, you know, I think South By is really wonderful. I think for South By, there's a lot of noise at that festival that's not just films. There's the tech fest, there's the music fest. So you really have to have a game plan if you're planning to go there because it's not just a film festival. So, so Dave, uh, speaking of festivals, uh, you've been um, known to think out of the box. And uh, it, I remember uh, in that regard, I remember when you were involved in setting up your own 
festival, a semi-theatrical event tour around a single film with Kevin Smith. I was wondering if, uh, if you could, it, it was very novel when you did that back then, might have been like 2003 or, or so. And, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that experience, what you learned from it, and how um, the semi-theatrical experience can still work today. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Thanks, Steve. I think, you know, in respect to my experience with Kevin on a movie called Red State, that was a narrative feature film, but but the the sort of distribution plan we designed can easily, uh, you know, it can easily be used for documentaries. And in fact, in some ways is being used on some documentaries in this day, day and age. That was, you know, you know, and this goes back to sort of the question of building an audience. Uh, it's not necessarily easy for you or me to build an audience from scratch, but you know, for someone like Kevin Smith, who, you know, had big successes with Clerks and a handful of other films before this, he was one of the first on social media early on. And he knows his audience better than anyone else. And he communicates with them regularly uh, on uh, Instagram, and I mean, on Twitter, which is his a medium of choice. Uh, because we knew that Kevin understood his audience and because Kevin had more than a million people that followed him on Twitter regularly, uh, we understood something that most distributors didn't at the time. We understood that we were able to self-distribute the film by literally getting on a bus with a projector and going theater to theater and promoting this tour, if you will, on social media only. Uh, so it costs us very little uh, in respect to what they call p a to support this. But again, Kevin had an advantage compared to others because he had a brand name to some extent. Uh, we played theaters like the Will Turn in LA, Radio City Music Hall in New York, and a handful of others. Uh, and, you know, after that, we were able to design uh, sort of early pioneers of day and date. That's a phrase that, is ten that tends to be used when someone says, you know, I'm making my film available in the theater and simultaneously going to make it available on transactional video on demand. Uh, transactional video on demand, not to get into the weeds, or things like iTunes and Amazon Prime, uh, et cetera. Uh, so after our tour, we then went into traditional theaters for a night and simultaneously made the film available uh, to, uh, to iTunes and other platforms. And then, you know, uh, a few months after that, we made the film available to Netflix and available to DVD on DVD through a Lionsgate. So the point I'm trying to make is that that was a very bespoke distribution plan. I think we're seeing, you know, sort of the roots of that being used today by uh, Neon, which I had mentioned, you know, in my opening is a releasing a film called uh, Spaceship Earth, which played uh, the Sundance Film Festival. Uh, Spaceship Earth, I really liked. It's a quirky film about the biosphere and their experience. I think, you know, their timing in an ironic way or, or maybe a perfect way is about self quarantining that's what the film's about so they're living in a a biosphere so to be able to watch that film in your house is really great what they did was because they couldn't tour they made the film available my understanding from what i've read i have nothing to do with the film but i think they're very smart um a uh, marketers they made the film available uh you know in a handful of drive-ins uh that were acting in a in a you know, with a, you know, responsibility to social distancing. And then they also made uh, the film available to a specialized bookstores in states that are now open and set up a seating that uh, was within the CDC uh, requirements of making sure seats were six feet apart, etc. They screened the film simultaneously for people who wanted to be a part of that experience with a community. They then simultaneously made the film available on platforms uh, through their own web, right? So meaning that 
they they teamed up with a handful of of uh, organizations like for instance in LA where I'm based you know they used KCR a W and NPR st station they used some bookstores uh, to promote the film and basically the on air a promotion said that uh, you know if you were to watch the film via their link for three ninety nine. 50% of the profits would go directly to the organization in which you were listening to, to help them during this difficult time. Uh, so I thought it was very, very smart. I don't know what the results are. Uh, and simultaneously, the movie's available on iTunes or anywhere else that you want to use it. So again, that was sort of another form of day and date, which I think can lend itself very well to specific documentaries that have built in audiences. And I think that's the key to any documentary, really understanding you know, who your core audience is. You know, what are their interests? Are they like-minded? Do they wanna, do they wanna sort of see your story? Do you have a particular take on your story? I think, uh, not to go off on a tangent, but recently, you know, in the press, we've all read that there are more than a dozen uh, documentaries that have gotten off the ground that uh, are about COVID-19. Seemingly, they all can't, you know, uh, get to the finish line at the same time, but perhaps they can if they're if their if their narrative paths, if their story paths are all different, if their access is different. Uh, so I think you know it's really exciting, uh, and I think that people should not necessarily think in traditional and conventional ways anymore. They should align themselves, you know, with people who have the ability to think outside the box to some extent. Well, that there's my follow up on what you just said is that so. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker and I make a, a documentary about my grandpa Irving and it's, and he ran like, I don't know, a butcher shop for 40 years, but it goes into the festival world and it wins a bunch of awards and it's well received because I've done a very good job of telling a story, but it's a very personal film. It's very hard to market compared to a lot of other movies. Right. And so the question is, what are the alternative ways to market a documentary like that? If the distributor either a, doesn't he really have any marketing funds or I have to self-distribute? Right. Again, uh, I would start early on and you're talking about your grandpa Irv and you're talking about him being a butcher, I think you said, right? No, I'm yeah, serious. Yeah, 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 yeah. There, there, there are two buckets immediately that I'd break it down to. Grandpas, right? Okay. Hashtag grandpa. Go just look at that now. You'll find tons of groups that are supportive of grandpas and figure out perhaps a path in and butchers or meat eaters. Okay. That, that, you know, may be politically <laughs> incorrect in this day and age, but there are many of us that are still doing it. Right. So again, it's just another way in, you have to have some ingenuity to figure out a path, you know, telling a simple sto story is done and done and not that interesting. Uh, so uh, those are just two sort of off the top of my head ideas on how you can sort of get in. And I'd start building the community on social media early on. Those are things that need help. There are other films that are more specific that you may not want to start as early on because they, they're more broad based and you don't want to sort of run out of room. You want to figure out sort of your clock and say, we really want to start to build this two months prior to the opening rather than a year prior when I'm building an audience. Uh, so I think it really depends on, you know, the story you're telling and how you're going to get there. All right. Steven. Uh, Dave, the road to distribution is getting trickier and trickier. <laughs> there are um, more and more films getting made uh, competing for a distributor's attention. Distributors have been burned recently. It's, it's very challenging for them. It's an expensive business. They've become very, very selective. Uh, so you're a filmmaker and you're looking at your options. What's your best distribution um, uh, platform? How, how do you get there? What, where do you think your, your film will, will be viewed the best? I mean, obviously you have to think about what the goals are. Is this uh, is the goal of the film to kickstart a public policy? conversation is it about um, making money returning money to the investors is it is it just about impressions and having people see your work what are the um, tell us about the differences now that uh, more and more filmmakers are looking to aggregators 
over distributors. Uh, they are, seem to be a more accessible option. Dave, could you take a, just a minute or two to just to tell us about an aggregator, what's the difference between what aggregators do and distributors do? How do they work? And is that a consideration for documentary filmmakers seeking distribution? Sure, it's a big question. So I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, but, you know, again, I think, as you said, you have to self-reflect early on to understand what your goals are. Uh, you know, I'm a, when I'm producing films, I do it for two reasons. I do it because I'm passionate about the subject in which I'm trying to tell and the story in which I'm trying to sort of tell. Uh, quite often, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to affect social change to some extent, or at least an awareness about things that people may not be aware of. Uh, and thirdly, you know, I come from the school of having a fiduciary responsibility to, you know, try to, uh, you know, give my investors, if there are any, a return. So, you know, I have the opportunity to come back over and over and they can be a support of, you know, from time to time. But I think, you know, it's really important to figure out those goals early on. And the difference between sort of a distributor and an aggregator without naming names is I think good distributors can help create bespoke distribution plans that can maximize, you know, uh, the visibility and hopefully uh, the economics for your particular film. Uh, and aggregators, you know, tend to want you to do the heavy lifting and for you to do the work. Uh, and, you know, those are really the differences to some extent. I think, you know, just the term aggregator just by definition means that, you know, they have a lot on their plate. You know, distributors tend to have, you know, uh, you know, no more than 10 to 12 films in a given year, which they calendar effectively. We're living through a very a unique disruptive time that nothing is what it was. So, uh, you know, you're going to want to understand early on when you're talking to people, assuming there are more than one that like it, you know, let me understand your plan. And then I want to hear what your pivot plan is. What if there's another pandemic? What happens at that time? I just want to cover all corners right now to figure out how my film's going to maximize its exposure and, and ultimately uh, its economics. Uh, so I don't know if that answered it, but, uh, you know, I think that's, that's sort of a, a general view on it. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the, uh, what I always would be curious too is like, um, if I go to a festival and I get a deal uh, for theatrical or for streaming, I mean, what should I expect as far as, you know, you know, giving up rights or ownership or, you know, is it a licensing deal? Do they buy something, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I think Steve is probably better versed to sort of talk about that as, as an attorney, but I, I would simply say that in general right now, uh, you know, documentary films are not seeing huge minimum guarantees. There are a handful that have, right? Uh, the mm. AOC documentary, you know, I believe was sold for 10 million bucks or so. Uh, yeah. You know, that's an anomaly. Uh, and, you know, it's like winning the lottery to some extent. Uh, and timing was a big part of that, right? So, so that's very different. So I think you have to be realistic. And again, you have to set your goals before a festival, if that's where you're, or before doing a screening, whether it's a festival or whether you're screening, you know, for a series of buyers, you have to understand, you know, you have to make a list early on, on, on in an ideal world. And I think you have to really take a step back and, and make sure you have aligned yourself with a great sales agent and or great attorney who is acting in that particular way. Uh, they can help you build the strategic plan in respect to selling your movie uh, because you need to approach it with a plan. You can't just say, let's screen it and see what they say. That's not how it works anymore. Uh, you need to do, you know, a lot of the work beforehand. You need to understand in different organizations who should see the movie, who is more like-minded to enjoy 
the subject in which you're about to show them. Uh, and, you know, uh, figure out a way to, you know, if, if it's something where, you know, their friend or spouse or child might like the subject more, then urge them to have them see it with them. There's just different ways of looking at it. So, you know, in respect to giving up rights, I mean, you know, Netflix by almost definition now is looking for worldwide rights to films uh, in perpetuity, you know, mm -hmm. so that's their business mo a model. It's very good, but just understand that going in. So, you know, if you make a movie for a dollar, you certainly want to sell it for at least a dollar if you can, right, right, right. Uh, you know, uh, because you're not going to see another dime after that. Uh, there are other companies that do it far differently. A traditional distribution company like, you know, a Focus or an A24 or a Searchlight, you know, is willing to put up a minimum guarantee, money up front. Uh, you know, uh, so, and you tend to give up, you know, for lack of a better term, most of your rights within the territory in which they're buying for, you know, roughly you know, 15 to 25 years. Every deal is different. Sure. Uh, so I don't know if that explained it, but uh, I just yep. tried to sort of take a bite at that apple. Steven? Uh, I, I'll, I will dovetail that with just a few, uh, with a comment, observations of rights that, that um, documentary producers might want to hold on to uh, and reserve them in the event they don't feel that the distribution, distribution company um, has a game plan for it and maybe have a way to have those rights revert in the event the distribution company does not take advantage, does not sell the media. One of them, I think, is an often, of, often overlooked segment of the market, and that's educational media. Um, the, not all traditional distribution companies understand the specialized education market and for documentaries that's a very very important uh area uh where you can uh project the issue from your documentary into a high school a college um adult education and uh so uh and i think the idea of having semi-theatrical or community screenings those the um, filmmakers are um are encouraged to at least hold on to those rights on a non-exclusive basis so that if you do decide to show your, your documentary at church or a synagogue, you're not in breach of the contract. And if, if there are dollars that, that come out of that and you wanna donate that um, to a charitable cause, you can do that. So I think a um, non-exclusive rights for, your, for semi-theatrical screenings and educational rights are two rights that should not be handed over um, just a, um, as part of any distribution deal, unless there's a specific program that the, that the uh, distribution company has. Those are just two, two things that we see over and over again in the licensing of, of documentaries. Uh, there are many more issues. I'm personally struck, and Dave, perhaps you can speak to this, as to how long the term of these agreements have run. They're now running um, you know, 10 to 20 years. Um, and uh, it's the first two years typically where the, where the greatest value of a film is, is, is seen. Sure. I'll, I, I, I think from my perspective, you know, I'll play devil's advocate as a distributor as well, right? That, that you're 100% right. The first two years is when most of the money is sort of pulled from the movie. But, you know, film distribution is very costly. Uh, so the P&A, print and advertising, that's put behind it, uh, you know, needs to be recouped. Uh, so if you're working with a legitimate company that is, you know, trying to uh, make this a theatrical endeavor, uh, and assuming the theatrical works, then all of the ancillaries, i.e. transactional video on demand, streaming video on demand, which is like pay TV, that's the, net, the Netflixes and HBOs of this world, and then free TV, which is basic cable, for instance, come after that, and the value will increase exponentially if the theatrical uh, works. Uh, I would say that, you know, a lot of films 
you know, we can, this can be, you know, an entire debate, but don't recoup, okay, to some extent for the distributor. Uh, they, you know, and we all know that there's the Hollywood accounting, right? That, that it's a term used wide, widely for, you know, oh, a distributor, you know, uh, is not going to provide any overages because, you know, they provided an MG. I don't think that's actually true. There are some companies definitively that, that you know, are more challenged to provide, you know, uh, an accounting that I think makes sense for everyone. But more specifically, I think they, they try and keep a film for longer than two years because, you know, for a lot of companies in that space, uh, there may be a, a, a library sale somewhere down the road. Uh, there may be, and this is one of the rights I think you should try to reserve as well. Steve didn't mention this, but I think the remake rights, okay, M meaning if your story can potentially become a narrative film, you, you know, you want to be able to participate in that to some extent. Now, obviously, if a distributor is coming to you and writing a big check, they're going to want that. And, and that's understand, understandable, but, you know, you should certainly have a conversation about trying to participate in some manner uh, if that is to happen or you know you can you know maybe they have a time frame to set that up and if they don't within that time the rights will revert back to you there's different ways of uh, looking at it but yeah, I'm uh, glad you mentioned that yeah but I, um, I do think I do think you know the, the the 10 15 20 years you know you know I think there's also hopes there was a time when for instance uh, a, a, a streaming media, you know, was, wasn't a thing. There was simply DVD. And before that there was VHS. So over the course of decade to decade, there seems to be a new medium that's invented that gives some of these films an opportunity to uh, earn more money over that time, time frame. It's not a given, but, but, you know, there's definitely that opportunity as well. Okay. How about some Q and A, Rivka? Yes, you guys have been giving some great questions. So we'll start with one from Brad Hamilton. You mentioned Fahrenheit 911. Michael Moore excels at marketing his docs, maybe the best ever. What makes him so successful? I think primarily what makes Michael successful are his uh, stories. I mean, they're provocative, uh, they're controversial, and he's not afraid to sort of hit the nail on the head. And Michael himself is a provocateur. He's not afraid to challenge the media or the audiences or the government or anyone else. So, uh, you know, I think audiences appreciate that to some extent. But again, I think the most, you know, the best thing that Michael has is his ability to be a great filmmaker and, and storyteller. So, you know, the subjects, when you think about, you know, his films, the subjects he's a, a chosen are, are really phenomenal. From Debbie Elbin, we have a question. How are you changing your strategy now with COVID-19 changing the entire landscape from production to distribution? Wow, that's a big question. So I'm in the middle of post-production on one of my own films right now, uh, as was mentioned at the beginning. And, you know, we're working uh, remotely right now. We are editing our film. Uh, we are conducting uh, interviews, uh, on the phone and with special um, um, uh, microphones and things like 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 that, you know, we're still lucky enough to be able to continue working on our film. Unlike, you know, legitimate production. I think there was an article. Was it in the L.A. Times today, Steve? Uh, that it was that, a New York today's New York Times business section. So there was an article in the New York Times today about uh, you know the amount of documentaries in general that you know are still continuing uh to both you know shoot and edit uh their films they are in pr a production if you will because as documentarians we are you know sort of guerrilla filmmakers sometimes it's just us with a camera you don't necessarily need a big crew sometimes the same person that's doing the interview is editing is producing is directing so I think the point being is, you know, this pandemic is terrible. Uh, it's a disruption, you know, uh, to every aspect of life as we know it. 
Uh, I'm hopeful that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm hopeful that some of the stories that will be told through this time will be amazing. You know, I'm hopeful that there's a cure. I'm hopeful that no more people, you know, uh, or fewer people will get sick and ultimately die. I mean, it's really, really, hopefully a once in a lifetime experience uh, that you don't wish on anyone. But we are storytellers. We want to continue to create and provide, you know, stories for people uh, to experience. And, you know, I think the pandemic will also ultimately change how some of the distribution platforms will look at documentaries. I think when you talk about what's going on today, there are two documentaries that are what people used to call sort of, you know, water cooler conversation. It's part of the zeitgeist. They're series, so they're not films per se, but the two, Tiger King being one, everyone is talking about that, okay? Whether you like it or not, people are talking about it. And then, and then, um, I'm sorry. And then we have, uh, you know, films, uh, I'm sorry, the Michael Jordan documentary right now that, that, you know, I'm a sports fanatic. So if there was a documentary on, on, on a shuffleboard now, I would uh, watch it. But give me Michael jo Jordan, it's phenomenal. And again, it's part of the conversation. So, and I think those two are examples of continuing to build a, a larger, it's an audience. They may be at home, but more people are not afraid to use the D word uh, that might have been in the past. They're not afraid to tell their friends they watched a documentary. And that to me is an amazing thing. And I think we'll continue to see that grow and grow. Here, here. Rivka? We have um, a question from Hannah Raymond. Hypothetical, a filmmaker has a film for sale, non-exclusively with a small distributor who is not particularly commercial or well-funded. The distributor loves the film and encourages the filmmaker to find a larger, more commercial and up-to-date distributor, hoping for the best for the film. What advice would you give the filmmaker in his or her search to give the film a wider audience and in finding a second better distributor? You know, I think that's a really loaded question. I think, you know, what I'm hearing is, you know, the term we use is that you as a film a maker or a producer have a backstop deal, meaning there's a deal in place, you're just not, uh, you're not really happy with that deal. Uh, so, you know, I don't know what you did to get to that place. So there's a lot of, of variables. I know that there are no festivals right now that you can play your film in, uh, but there are virtual festivals. There are ways of getting it in front of like audiences, or you need to figure out how to help the distributor that appreciates it right now to do a better job, uh, you know, to get behind it in a way. I think what I'm hearing is they don't want to put a lot of money behind it. Therefore, uh, you know, uh, they, they are telling you they'd be happy if you found another home. Uh, you know, I don't particularly like that, you know, and I don't like the idea that you're not happy with the distributor. That conversation should have happened early on when you were making those decisions. Those decisions should have been based on what their plans were and whether or not you accepted and liked that should have happened at that time. Thank you. This one is from Ralph Hammond. Um, and I think it's getting to the idea of, of length when you are approaching a film festival. Is it unreasonable to expect a film festival of the sort you mentioned to consider a three hour film about a poet? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, not, it's not out of the question, Ralph, but, but I would say that, you know, anything that starts with a two is already a psychological prohibitive sort of thing. There's, and I'm not suggesting that's good or bad. I'm only giving you the reality of the marketplace right now. You're dealing with a lot of curators and sort of depending upon, you know, who's watching it, but a lot of the festivals, the programming team starts with sort of the gate keepers, which tend to be younger people who, you know, may have ADD uh, and anything that, you know, that sounds like it's long, it's just gonna get harder for them to watch it. You may have made a great film and if you can get them to watch it, it may be fine, but just getting them to pay attention 
is going to be a challenge. So it's tougher. If you can make that same film, you know, in, in less time, I would urge you to do it. And be disciplined. It's hard. You know, I think we all go through the process of trying to make a film. And I think, you know, when you make a documentary, it's really the pacing is such an important component. You know, people need to want to see more and leave them with wanting to see more at the very end. How did you, this is from Brad Hamilton, how did you get hired to work on The Thin Blue Line, which was a great film in the first documentary you saw in a theater? Yeah, so uh, I didn't get hired to work on it. I was working at a distribution company uh, in the late 80s called Miramax Films, uh, and they distributed the movie, and I was a young kid at the time, and I was lucky enough to be able to be involved with that. Let's see here. This one's actually for Steve. I'm sure you can both address this. Can you address a situation in which your distributor has N American rights, education and digital, but no foreign? So when they launch the digital release, I assume that means it's geo-blocked, but would a foreign distributor even be interested in digital for the rest of the world? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I address geo-blocking and the impact on the international sales market. Uh, in the most recent edition of Documentary Magazine. It, it may not have come out yet, but it's about to, if it, if it hasn't. Um, and uh, it's, it's a real consideration. If without geo-blocking, it's very easy for, um, for the markets to blend together because someone can pick up a, um, the, the film from North America and, uh, or, international bring it to North America and which is the much more lucrative market and effect, and uh, effectively um, diminish that mar the value of that market so there's a debate going on right now in in Europe about uh, geo blocking because it actually has some harmful effects in a in a, um, a European Union where they're trying to tear down walls they want to make things available cross border and, but if that happens, it, it certainly diminishes the territorial nature of the sales market in film documentaries as well as narratives. And of course, uh, so many filmmakers do co-productions with European um, you know, broadcasters. And so that, uh, that whole model of distributing films and financing films could go out the window. So it, it, the answer to the question is it's very tricky and another dynamic aspect of our business. Yeah, and I would just add to that, that a traditionally, depending upon the scale of the documentary, but you know, most North American distribution companies will try to negotiate a holdback. So they would suggest that, you know, for instance, the European digital rights, the streaming rights, if you will, cannot go earlier than the US rights. And typically the US rights would provide an outside date in order for them to go. So you would have sort of a defined time if you're negotiating. The other part of that question is, you know, do companies buy just that? Sort of, yes. Uh, you know, that's growing. But for instance, a company like Netflix, which is not, you know, a transactional video on demand. So they're, they're a streaming video on demand, meaning there's a subscription base to it, but they're constantly, or I shouldn't say they're constantly, but they will continue to look for international worldwide rights to movies that have domestic distribution in, in place. Just one example. This one is for David from Anne Shertoff. Can you talk about money in the sales and distribution of docs? What can one expect as a fair market spend versus an advance a company is giving you? I'm not clear what a fair market spend is. I, I think, you know, is it, is it about the acquisition price? Maybe they can be more specific. Yeah, and uh, would you be able to clarify in the chat box? And then I'll be happy to answer it. Maybe we can go to the next one and come yeah. back. Oh, and acquisition spend might mean the market. Price. What's that? Acquisition. acquisition. Acquisition price. Oh, I see. Okay. What's a fair acquisition price? There's no such thing as a fair acquisition price. It's the value that a distribution company believes your movie is worth. So, you know, it could be anywhere from nothing to 10 million bucks that we just saw for you know, the AOC doc. So 
it, it, it's it, that's a hard question to answer. I don't know, Steve, if you have any further. It, it's thoughts purely a, it's it's about the market. And the market is sensitive to timing, to topics. I mean, you want to add uh, value to your project. You know, get a get a meaningful executive producer who's committed to whatever you're doing that is willing to go out there and tap into their social media to, to tweet to show up. There are all these different things that you can do, but when you're going to, to a, when you're going to a distribution company, it it's about how do you convert your film into an opportunity for them. If you're just banging on your on their door with a generic film, they're not going to be interested. The idea is to make your film so um, uh, so special that they can't afford to live without your film, and that's up to you. It's not up to them. And the marketplace is a part of that. But think about if you were a buyer, what would you want? Uh, why would you want that? And, and I just want to add, because this came up a years ago when I was an executive where, where, you know, the person I was working for said, well, what do you want to buy the film for? And I said, X. And they said, well, what's the budget? You know, and I said, what does that make a difference? What the budget is? I'm telling you what the value is now. The movie's finished. So whether, whether it exceeds the budget or is below the budget doesn't really matter from the buyer's point of view at that point of view. It's only worth what, what they think the movie's worth based on their experiences and, and you know, working on a handful of other films. Maybe they're wrong and maybe it exceeds that, which is great, but, but they, they, that's their a basis for it. But you should never try and approach a deal simply thinking that you're going to definitively get what you put into it out of a distribution deal. Uh, for the final question, because I know we're a, little, we're a little bit over, but this is a great last question. Can you please walk us through best practices for a filmmaker taking a film out of post and to a successful sale? Who do you need on your team, sales agent, lawyer, and when should you bring them on board? So, you know, I said earlier, it's really important to, to align yourself, I think, with both a sales agent and an attorney. I think an attorney, you know, can serve a purpose, depending upon your film, at looking at your clearance issues, for instance, your insurance issues, understanding, you know, previous deals with other uh, buyers and what their needs may be, making sure you have enough money in your post budget to be able to uh, deliver, et, et cetera. A sales agent, and sometimes it can be both, right? But a sales agent is going to continue to help you try to strategize how you are going to ultimately sell the film to the best company for the best price uh, in the market at that time. And I think both of them should certainly be brought on no later than a rough cut. So they're sharing a rough cut with you if you're confident that your rough cut is in decent shape you know, that, you know, and sometimes I think a lawyer should be brought on much earlier than that, depending upon the subject matter of the film. If it's a film that has music issues, for instance, that, you know, may not be easy, you're going to want to, you know, coordinate with an attorney early, early on. You're going to want to discuss whether or not your film should use fair, fair use or not on some of the archival stuff you may be using. So I just think there's various issues, but at the latest, an attorney should be brought on, I think, you know, around rough cut stage so they can help look at what your needs may be. Uh, and I think a sales agent should be brought on to help you. They've seen lots of films. So I think from a creative point of view, if they're a good sales agent, they may be able to look at a rough cut and say, you know what, right now it's running, you know, two hours and 45 minutes. I would suggest maybe trying to look at this section, this section, and this section, bring it down a little bit. These are the buyers who I think might be interested. I know they particularly like, you know, subject uh, matters about X, Y, and Z. Let's, let's sort of, you know, try to st step on the gas a little bit more on those areas. I just think there's lots of finessing they can help with and then ultimately try to uh, strategize in respect to, to formulating the best possible deal. I appreciate that answer, David. I think you really covered a lot of ground uh, throughout the entire session today. I'm so grateful that you, you were able to join us and give us a best practices discussion for marketing 
and distributing documentary films. And good luck to you on that on on the Great Black Woodstock project. Uh, hope you uh, hope you have great success with it. So thank thanks you. again for coming by. Thank you, Steve, and thanks, Dan and Rivka. Thank you very very much. Uh, I appreciate the time, um, and uh, this is a great. A seminar that you guys are doing and uh, you know I look forward to watching more of them in the, the future. Next year it can. Next year it can. <laughs> next we'll, year in we'll can. Totally. Can. Okay. On that note here's here's my uh, you know a rosé wine. Cheers everybody. Cheers. Thank you Cheers. so much. Thank you all for being with us.